Uh, yeah, my name is Simon Freyer. Uh, I'm from North Carolina State University. I'm a PhD student right now, and I'm working under the direction of Dr. Craig Yencho, who's been mentioned a few times. Um, this project, uh, excuse me for the long title there, it's kind of the synthesis of a number of other projects. Uh, essentially, we did a couple QTL analyses using this Tanzania Beauregard mapping population, specifically for Meloidogyne nematode resistance. And then we, <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we developed uh, cast based assays for marker assisted selection in sweet potato. So a little bit of context on North Carolina. Um, we produce about 66% of the nation's sweet potato crop. And last year that was worth nearly half a billion dollars. Um, but most of that gets exported. Well, I shouldn't say most, about half gets exported to Europe. Um, and 90% of that crop is a single variety Covington, which is a North Carolina variety. Um, looks like there's a little bit of formatting issues switching between slides and PowerPoint. Uh, but for sweet potato, remember, as Marcelo mentioned, uh, we get segregation in the F1 level. This is a biparental cross you're looking at in that little picture there. Um, our, our general breeding strategy is recurrent mass selection. One thing that's really nice about this crop is one chance seedling can become a major variety because everything's clonal after the seedling stage. Meloidogyne are the root knot nematodes. There's something like 500 species. Um, a lot of them have a really broad host range. The ones that we're most concerned with in North Carolina are Meloidogyne incognita, southern root knot nematode. Um, that's a pretty common one. A lot of growers have it and have learned to deal with it over the years. Um, and then we also have Meloidogyne enterolobii. And that's the guava root knot nematode, so named because it decimated the Brazilian guava industry. This one also has a really broad host range and it's under internal quarantine in North Carolina. So half of our crop that goes to Europe can't leave the state if this is detected. And they're using PCR tests to find it. So it's a really big issue. Um, we basically need to rely on resistance to prevent the spread. And of course, all major US varieties are susceptible to this nematode. So we look elsewhere outside the US and Tanzania, as it turns out, um, I think in 2018, we discovered that it is resistant um, in, a, in a quarantined bioassay that we did in a greenhouse. Beauregard, the uh, reciprocal parent, or rather the other parent in the TB population is susceptible. So we inoculated 250 segregating progeny of this cross. Uh, TB has been around for a while. Uh, we just became aware of this nematode problem around 2013 in North Carolina, and this work was mostly done in 2018. We inoculated each of these progenies with 10,000 nematode eggs. And then after a period of eight weeks, which allows for multiple life cycles of the nematode, we extracted those eggs and we counted them. If you end with more eggs than you start with, you have a positive reproductive factor, a reproductive factor greater than one. And if you have fewer eggs than you started with, you're considered resistant and you have a reproductive factor less than one. We did look at a couple other uh, measures of resistance, including eggs per gram of root tissue and gall. Uh, severity ratings. What we found was almost a perfect one-to-one -one correlation or one-to-one -one segregation for resistance. So half the population, uh, or 49% at an RF greater than one was susceptible and half the population was considered resistant by that <laughs> measure. And that got us thinking, uh, it, we'll get to the QTL analysis in a second, but that got us thinking, you know, if we can reimagine the Punnett square Maybe Tanzania has one copy or one haplotype carrying a resistance allele. Beauregard has no copies of that. And since we get three, uh, we get essentially three chromosomes from mom, three chromosomes from dad. If you have one copy, then you can expect half the progenies to have that resistance. Marcel talked a lot about this already. Um, QTL analysis, essentially we're correlating genotype data with phenotype data. I just described the phenotype data we collected, and our genotypic data was from GBS poly, which was mentioned earlier. Um, it's a genotyping by sequencing protocol that's optimized for essentially for sweet potatoes, highly heterozygous polypoid crops. Um, <clears throat> our linkage map was modified from the one that Marcelo described, um, and that was based on the diploid Ipomyotrifida reference genome. We, we did some filtration steps as well. Again, very similar to what Marcelo described, um, removing markers that were missing from a large part of the population or markers that occurred in low frequency. And we also identified any selfs of Tanzania that don't belong in that linkage map. Um, we used the QTL poly package to perform a QTL analysis 
And for that, we use the random effects model that was described. We also did a fixed effect model just to compare the two and found very similar QTLs. Um, and I haven't heard view poly mentioned yet, but I particularly like this program or this package. Um, it, it runs through R as a shiny app and I find it to be very breeder friendly. It's very interactive, sliding scales. You can create images on the fly and it's, it's a little more accessible for people who don't know R very well. Um, so this is our, uh, our QTL, IB, Ipomia batatis, ME, Meloidine, and Terralobii on chromosome four, and it's the first QTL we found there. Um, and this is a pretty major QTL that describes about 70% of variation for resistance to the guava root knot nematode that we described. In terms of base pairs, this is about a 10 mega base region that we've narrowed it down to, or 0.3% of the sweet potato genome. And my work was not unprecedented. Dr. Bonnie Aloka, um, one of my predecessors, did a very similar QTL analysis for that southern root knot nematode I described, Meloidine incognita. And he found a single major QTL, this time on chromosome seven, explaining about 60% of variation for resistance. So our, our next thought was, can we turn these major QTL into selectable markers? Um, and in order to do so, we basically took the principle find that QTL peak position, identify any SNPs there or flanking there and design primers around that. I don't have time to describe this pipeline in great detail, but it's big thanks to Dr. Robin Buell's team at UGA. Um, we had slightly different data sets for Tanzania and Beauregard, but essentially we aligned both parents with the Ipomia trifida reference assembly, did our variant calling, and then essentially searched for either simplex or pentaplex SNPs within those QTL regions. And we narrowed it down to about 2,500 SNP markers. And then uh, just as I described, um, we figured out what our budget was and said, how many uh, SNPs can we afford to design primers for and test on these TB progenies? We settled on 24, 12 for guava and 12 for southern root knot nematode, six on either side of the respective QTLs. And of those 24 markers that we had primers designed for and submitted, about 11 of them actually worked during PCR, but four of those 11 were significant, two for guava, two for southern. And what we're looking at are CASP cluster plots um, in the SNP viewer software that LGC provides. Uh, essentially, um, the way CASP or competitive allele specific PCR assays work, uh, they introduce two fluorescent dye molecules that will um, become unquenched or glow under the presence of a certain uh, SNP or piece of DNA. Um, on the, it, it'll align more with the y-axis if it's say AA and more on the x-axis if it's say CC. And if they're somewhere in between, it's probably heterozygous. You'll notice that these are, um, there's that pink cluster in, in plot C there, and that's, that's associated with the question mark. So that was uncallable. This is designed for diploids, not for polyploids. We were pretty pleased with this work, but we wanted to test more markers and in more diverse backgrounds than just the Tanzania Beauregard population. And we also ended up uh, at this time switching to working with Intertech um, and expanding that marker panel a little more. So now we had 30 markers, including those original ones that worked well for us and 26 new ones. Um, the bottom left here in, in black and white, those are kind of the raw CASP uh, plots, if you will. Um, and then we worked with Dr. Guy Pereira. Again, he's been a great help throughout this project. Um, he helped train us up on using Fit Poly, which allows us to do dosage calling on these. And so now we're able to visualize not just that question mark cluster, but actually how many copies of a given uh, allele are present. And uh, let's see here. Um, in order to decide, you know, are these actually significant or not, we, we use linear regression. There's also chi-square analysis results on this slide. Um, what we found was for, so we're looking at meloidogyne and terolobii, the guava root knot nematode right now. On the y-axis of these plots, this is MERF, so that's reproductive factor. We're just looking at that trait here. Um, and if it's, if it's very close, let's see, I think I have a pointer here. Can you guys see that? So, so like this little purple bar here, that's right near the, the origin. So that's zero, an RF of zero would be highly, highly resistant. 
and then anything that's not anything in this mouse. And then this pink plot here, um, those are RF scores from one up to very high numbers. Essentially, we can binarize that and say, are you resistant or not? And for these purposes, it was very significantly, um, these three markers were very significantly predictive of resistance, even though those R squares aren't perfect correlation, that doesn't really matter in this context. That's for guava. And then for Southern, we ended up having one marker, one of the initial ones we, we thought we had, uh, did not work as well in this diverse set of material. And I should explain that material a little bit too. This is, this is the synthesis of, I think 300 or so, um, really diverse sweet potato lines. So a bunch of TB lines, but also lines from North Carolina's breeding program, um, LSU, Africa, South America, old USDA lines, old US cultivars that aren't really grown in production anymore. Um, so the markers seem to be holding up in a pretty diverse set of materials at this point. Here's another way to kind of visualize uh, what we've been talking about. So on the on the x-axis, you have that dark blue bar and then the red bar. The dark blue bar indicates phenotypes that are resistant and the red bar indicates phenotypes that are uh, susceptible. And then we have our marker reads kind of above that. And as you can see where I've put the arrows, those are the markers that we've determined to be significant. They work in between 89 and 96% of cases across this diverse set of materials. Um, we can talk more about this offline too. I can explain every one of the discrepancies on there. Um, but for the most part, uh, the difficulty in phenotyping these has, has made it so that, uh, let's, let's say this line right here, for example, L1431, that one has an RF score of like 1.1. So it's really close to being resistant. The markers say it's resistant. I've only bioassayed it two times. So there's a good chance if I can get five or more data points on it, it actually will fall into that resistant bin. This is the slide I'm most excited to share with you guys. Um, this is second year material. Uh, so these were seedlings planted in 2021. They were propagated, planted in the field and selected that year. We select about 5% in the first year. And then they went through a second round of selection in 2022. We select about 15% in the second year. And um, this, this, is, this is about 200 lines here. This is all that's left of an initial set of say 20,000 seedlings. What we expect is half of these to be resistant, half to not be. And it can save us a lot of time and energy not having to bed these out, grow them again, run them through this whole bioassay if we can just screen them with, it, with our markers. Um, and I took the picture on the right, like just before I flew out here. So we're, we're just starting to use this. Um, ultimately, yeah, we're, we're pretty pleased to report that we have four markers now that really exceed our efficiency threshold. Um, three of them for guava and one of them for, for incognita. Uh, the cost of genotypes around $5 a sample now. We do wanna pursue additional validation. We're doing a genomic selection training population a bioassay, and I can talk more about that offline as well. Um, but we are seeing similar segregation in that population. Um, we're, we're putting a lot more energy into paired cross and getting away from polycross so that we can incorporate uh, these resistance genes or putative genes. Um, we're also working towards enrichment. We've only seen single copies of what we believe to be a, a major gene. Um, in all but one case, where I think we have two, if I can get four copies into a hexaploid, then 100% of its progenies will have at least one copy. Um, ultimately, yeah, I think uh, to, to sum it all up, we think what we have here is the first marker assistant selection in sweet potato. And we're very excited to share that with you guys today. And big thanks to like a hundred different scientists that helped out. Yeah.